uh, Italy or some other European country where the language is not English, you crave English after a while. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> and so every evening, it would seem like every evening we were at a different hotel in uh, either Rome or Sicily or wherever we were at. I lost track, Sorrento. And after you get unpacked and get settled down and get ready for dinner, what do you do? You turn the television on, right? And I start channel surfing for something in English. And sometimes nothing is available. I found out that this could be a good thing. Because there were times when I found CNN International or Fox News International. And the news I was watching was not very pleasant. Um, the hurricanes were going on. Terrorist attacks, unbelievable. Now they're throwing acid at people and they're ramming cars into, it's it just it's so depressing. We have a president who is shaking his finger at the rocket man in North Korea. And it, there were times I was wondering, are we gonna have a war while we're here in Italy trying to enjoy ourselves? It was really scary at times watching the news. Um, it's good to be back. I'm glad that the world seems to be in one piece, at least right now it is. Um, I remember one news account in particular that I could really relate to, and it's been on the news a lot lately, and that is the uh, opiate epidemic, the drug epidemic going on in our country today. Um, things are out of hand, and as I'm watching and listening, I'm thinking, boy, I have some first-hand knowledge about some of the drugs these people are taking like uh, fentanyl. I mean, just a little bit can kill you. Right now I'm wearing a patch, a fentanyl patch. It helps me deal with the pain that uh, I've been experiencing the last month or so. And you have to be very careful in putting this patch on. And I'm thinking, and people are dying over this stuff. I don't even want it. I don't want any part of it. Um, but, and then the pills that people are buying, Oc Oxycontin and morphine and other derivatives uh, from that drug. Hey, I've had to take those. And I didn't enjoy it at all, how it makes you feel. Fortunately, now I'm off all that. But this kind of epidemic is going on. It's reported in the news all the time. Young people, old people dying. I mean, it just reminds me, we are living in perilous times. And going on a two weeks vacation, I couldn't escape the bad news. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you, watching what's going on with North Korea, there were times when I was scared for us. I know I shouldn't be frightened, but I was. What's gonna happen next? The year 2017 has been uh, quite a year so far, and there's been much to be concerned about. So that leads me to my morning message, and maybe it's a question. We should ask ourselves, should we uh, be frightened? Is it okay as Christians to be afraid? And if we are, are there any benefits from this fear? Hmm. Our scripture lesson today is a small portion of a letter written by St. Peter, and he's giving some instructions to the church on how to live the Christian life. You can follow along in your bulletin insert. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter begins by saying, don't just pretend to be good. And then he goes on to give some practical advice. He says that Christians should desire the word of God. That's right there in verse 2. He says, crave pure spiritual milk. And he also says the Christians should be prepared to sacrifice. <laughs> That's a toughie. I wonder if us soft Americans can be prepared to sacrifice. Verse 5 says, offer the spiritual sacrifices that please him, that please God. And in verse 10, Peter writes to the church, you are the people of God. You have received his mercy. And then, Midway through this chapter, there's this little sentence 
it's easy to miss if you're not paying attention. You can easily just zip right by two little words in verse 17. Peter says, fear God. The Bible is teaching us that within our relationship with God, there should be an element of fear. We love God. We trust God. We pray to God. And now Peter is telling us we are also to fear God. Now in the original language, the word that we translate as fear in the Greek, uh, we get the word uh, phobia, phobos. It means to be exceedingly afraid, uh, to be alarmed, or to be frightened. Frightened of God? Hmm. There's a little boy, he's sitting on his grandfather's lap, and uh, grandpa's reading him a bedtime story, and as grandpa's reading from the book, the little boy reaches up and he touches grandpa's face, and he touches his gray hair, and Grandpa notices it, but continues to read. And then finally, the little boy says, Grandpa, did God make you? Yes, he did. God made me a long time ago. And Grandpa, did God make me? Yes, indeed, God made you just a little while ago. Again, the little boy touches his face and his hair, and then he says, God's getting better at it, isn't he? <laughs> Peter uses this word fear to remind us that we should be like a little child in awe of God, feeling humble when we're in his presence. I could spend the next couple hours telling you about my experience in Rome and then especially in the Vatican. And maybe I will one day, but not in the, in the ser service. But there was a point when we were in the Vatican. And Sue, you can attest to this. And I was standing there looking around, and I was in such... I can still feel it as, as I think about it. I was in awe of the majesty of this place. And I started crying. I couldn't stop. I mean, there are tears just going down my cheeks and I'm looking around and I can almost feel the presence of God. It was quite a moment. I'll, I will never forget that. Um, it was, I, I felt a reverence for our Creator. I felt so small and then so grateful. This great, awesome God has created all this and given it to us and, and then He, in a moment of maybe forgetfulness decided to allow me to be a pastor and preach the gospel. Go ahead, do it, Bill. Places like that, and I know some of you may never be to Rome, and you may never visit the Vatican, but just looking at the pictures, it's an awesome experience. And you don't have to be a Catholic. You can be a Protestant there, and there were many Protestants there. So I picture God as... It's hard to picture him. But for some of us, we picture God as a, a kind of a Santa Claus figure. You know, we do that. Or we picture God as a fellow who looks like Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Bruce Almighty. That was an interesting movie. I hope you don't base your theology on what you watch on television or in the movies. <laughs> Stick to the Bible. But you know what? And even in that comedy, here's um, um, Bruce Nolan, I think is his name, played by Jim Carrey. And he's having a really bad day. Uh, he loses his job. He has a meltdown on television. He was some kind of a news reporter. Uh, he gets mugged. And then to top it all off, someone steals his car. And in the scene, he's standing there shaking his fist at God, angry, and just telling God off and, and daring him to do something and showing no reverence and no fear. And so Morgan Freeman, playing God, decides, okay, I'll give you a chance and let you play God. And uh, he learns a lot from that lesson. 
he begins to learn that uh, God is someone to be feared, someone to uh, be in awe of, to be respectful of. It's a good movie. You get a few laughs. Again, don't base your theology on what Hollywood gives us. But if you really want to know about God, you read your Bible, and, and then in 1 Peter, he sets the record straight. The entire 17th verse reads, show respect for everyone. This includes God. Show respect for everyone. Love your Christian <laughs> brothers and sisters. Fear God. Show respect for the king. Hmm. Let's continue on and explore some other passages in the Bible. Uh, I like to begin with the Psalms. I call this the, uh, this fearing God, we must be pure. And in Psalm 19.9, it says, reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The New King James Version reads, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring, Forever. The fear of the Lord. Fear of God and holiness and purity. They go together. And when our hearts are right with God, when we know that we're in a right relationship with our Creator, uh, that love that we have for Him translates into our lifestyle and what we project and how we deal with people. Sometimes, John, we have difficulties, right? And there are awkward situations that go on even in the church. Definitely. And, and you had to deal with one, and we won't go into it, but it was, it was difficult, but we did it in a Christ-like way. I read your letter. I appreciate what you did. Um, that's the way we do things as Christians. Fear the Lord. This passage here in the Psalms, um, not an easy message, because we're surrounded by so many people who are anti-God. Uh, there's so many elements out there that are fighting uh, against us, against what's good and what is holy. Living a, a genuine Christian life not only requires a lot of faith on our part, it requires God's power to help us. There's one old Methodist preacher who shared a ser sermon from 1 Peter chapter 2, and he told his congregation this, quote, Jesus Christ, who calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light, enables us to be in the world, but not of the world. And then he says, choose light and life, that you may be able to live through the darkness, choose life in Jesus Christ. The kind of fear, the kind of reverence that God demands of us is that we choose light and choose life in Jesus Christ. Seems pretty simple to me, pretty clear cut. So, we're in this world and things seem to be going crazy and again, I couldn't escape it in Italy watching the news and uh, we have a president saying, I'm going to bomb you and we've got a crazy guy in North Korea saying, I'm going to bomb you and, and oh my. We're in this kind of a world and it won't change. There's terrible things will continue to happen. So being a Christian is a 24-7 effort in living for Jesus, and it's made possible by the power of God. And, and notice that Psalm 19 states that this call to purity will, what, last or endure forever. Hmm. And the church takes a beating. We get a lot of negative press. And denominations go astray. And there are constant splits. Governments demand that we take down the Ten Commandments 
And they don't like it when we have in God we trust on our money. They'd like to wipe that clean. And let's face it, ministers let you down. In the local church, uh, sometimes it's a big name minister like the guy out in Texas. He got a lot of bad press lately. And the media loves it. They love a good church scandal. But the bottom line is this, church. The fear of the Lord is clean, pure, enduring forever, enduring forever, forever. <clears throat> The standards never change. And the call of God will not deviate. It always remains the same. God wants us pure and he wants us holy. And along with the call, there must be some wisdom. We go to Psalm 111, verse 10. Fear for the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. The rewards of wisdom come to all who obey him. Wow. And so there's this moment in time. An angel appears at an Ohio State football game <laughs> planning meeting. <laughs> it's being held in Columbus, Ohio. Just days before the big game, an angel appears. I think his name is Bo Schembeck. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Urban Meyer and all of his assistants. And the angel speaks to Urban and says, Urban, we've been watching you. Really, you have unselfish, exemplary behavior, and God wants to reward you with a choice of infinite wisdom, wealth, or God will give you a game plan that will beat the Wolverines. Without hesitation, Urban Meyer says, I'll take infinite wisdom. Bo smiles and poof, there's a maize and blue smoke and we grant you your request. The angel disappears. There's deathly silence in the room and all the assistant coaches are looking at Urban Meyer. And there's a, a look of concern on his face. The big game is tomorrow. Coach, one coach finally gives him a nudge and says, Urban, you've got to say something. And he looks around at the coaches and he says, I should have taken the game plan. <laughs> 2017 game. <laughs> Fear or reverence for God. It's not only a smart thing to fear God, it also has benefits. In my Matthew Henry commentary, it says this about the verse, men can never begin to be wise till they begin to fear God. All true wisdom takes its rise from true religion and has its foundation in it. Hmm. Put it another way. It's the wise man, it's the wise woman who responds in a positive way when they realize that there is a God. We all have that moment of truth, don't we? We've experienced it. That's why we're here today. There came that moment in time when you realized, I am so small. And there is a, a God. He's greater than anything I can imagine. And he's calling me to follow him. And a wise person will respond in the positive. And that wise person will worship God and give him all honor. And try to pattern his or her life after, after Jesus. Being a Christian is the only way to live. Loving God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. 
And having wisdom doesn't mean you can outsmart God. Wisdom isn't gathering up all that you can in this life. Wisdom isn't gained by having a big bank account or, or a great stock portfolio. Wisdom is possessing a genuine fear for the Lord. In the next book of the Bible, King Solomon begins Proverbs by stating that the purpose of these Proverbs is to teach people wisdom. And then in verse 7, listen to this. He says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Only fools despise wisdom and discipline. I mean, this is a major theme found throughout the book of Proverbs. This is the fundamental truth in Christianity. Fear of the Lord, the beginning of knowledge. And that brings me to my last point, Psalm 112, there must be happiness. 112 verse 1, happy are those who fear the Lord. Now this is, this is a rhetorical question, so you don't have to answer, but are you happy today? Are you happy to be here today? Are you happy that it's Sunday and you come and you worship and maybe you get to sing one of your favorite hymns, you listen to Brian on the piano, you watch the choir as we really try to do our best. <laughs> hey, we're happy over there. And I hope you're having a, a good, happy day. And you know what? It's good to be happy because that means you're blessed. You're blessed that you're in a 10 o'clock service and the pastor looks like he's winding down and soon we'll have fellowship. <laughs> you're happy knowing that you'll be out of here and you'll get to your favorite restaurant before all the Catholics. <laughs> that makes me blessed. <laughs> the word happy, when you read it in the Bible, uh, as used in the Psalms, is the word blessed. Happy, blessed as Christians. In all aspects of life, you're happy. I'm learning that now. You know what I'm going through. I had a doctor tell me, Mr. Cren, you have stage four cancer. It's in your lungs and it's in your rib cage. And so they've already zapped me with radiation and on Tuesday morning, I begin chemotherapy. But you know what? That doesn't take away my joy and my happiness. That's not going to rob me of how I feel about God and how, how I feel about life and what I'm doing. So even though I'm going through some interesting times, there's still joy in my heart. And I still smile and I still laugh and I love being here with you. I love what I do. And it's all because I have a reverential fear of God that I can have this kind of joy. When we are a believer in God and we recognize that he is awesome and that he is all powerful and that he is holy and we recognize what he has done for us, it makes you happy. I'll tell you, we, we should be the happiest people in this part of the world. When we leave, leave this building, we should have a smile on our face. When we go out to eat, when we talk about our church, we do it with a smile. We're happy because we're redeemed by the Lord. We are redeemed and we love Jesus and, and we know where we're headed. <laughs> well, I'm finished. I've said everything I can say tonight or this morning. I've got jet lag. <laughs> Praise about, the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> it's about two in the morning right now, body wise. But even with jet lag, I am happy because I fear the Lord. I'm happy, and this fear has given me a great foundation. And I just read to you, and I'll read it again, the fear of the Lord is clean, and it endures forever. Amen. 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 <clears throat>